Hold on. All right, let's have a second round of applause for Cote. I just need to uh, do this. There we go. Now, I had this all planned out. Anyhow, welcome to my talk. Uh, I'm going to go over uh, something that has happened a lot over the career uh, that I've had or that I've encountered, which is, you know, you've got all sorts of great ideas. Uh, you've got yet another way to uh, configure computers or whatever it is y'all do. Uh, and you're like, why don't people just use this stuff? It's clearly great. We went over the training. We uh, threw some Pact and O'Reilly books at them, told them to come back on Monday and just redo everything. And uh, we sent them to this conference uh, where they uh, have been improving the food, it sounds like. Uh, and like they're still doing nothing you asked them to. Uh, now, the good news is uh, I, I read recently that there was a ransomware attack that was foiled by running netware, uh, so you should look into that. Uh, it probably works out well. So I, I, I started thinking about this uh, when uh, I, I was in a, uh, a meeting. Uh, I have lots of meetings like this, and I've anonymized it, uh, as you can see. And this, uh, uh, people here will enjoy this. I live up in Amsterdam now, and every time there's a crime photo, this is what they do to anonymize them. And I always think, you know, maybe just don't. Like, I'm not really sure that's doing anything. Uh, but I've anonymized it sort of Netherlands style here. Uh, and it's also clip art, so this is not them. But I was talking with a, uh, a team of infrastructure people from a large bank. You know, one of those big banks that when you walk on a skyway, it's all like, why don't you live your best life by giving us your money? Uh, and they've got all these people with tattoos and things like that, like throwing their infants up in the air, hopefully catching them afterwards. Uh, and like, I was talking with this team, uh, and they, they were saying, uh, it's great, uh, all this stuff you're telling me about application developers and platforms. And we stood up a, a Kubernetes cluster, and those developers, they still don't use it, so now what, right? And so this happens over and over again uh, in conversations that I have where people put a platform in place. And I'm, I'm not going to... It is uh, astonishing uh, that the developers don't use it. It's generally, I'm not being sarcastic about it, it is kind of confusing because uh, the team has put a lot of effort in and they've stood it up and it's almost what developers have been asking for. And when I say developers, I mean application developers, uh, of course, not to get lost down that rabbit hole of things. This is often happening in larger organizations in smaller organizations and especially tech companies where someone got the, the memo 15 years ago about DevOps, a lot of that's been uh, collapsed, or as often happens, kind of the application developer that wasn't doing a great job now owns the servers uh, and sort of builds up that platform uh, and becomes the one who's doing that. It doesn't happen so much there. They have their own problems. Uh, but this is mostly in large organizations. And so what I want to go over is understanding not only maybe why those developers are not changing and doing things, but why people in the larger organizations are doing it. Because if you work in a large organization or you've consulted with one, your IT people are often the least of your problems. Uh, they, they are a problem, but there's all these other people in a large organization that become uh, an issue. Now, as I go through that, uh, I also wanted to cover uh, a project that I've been working on called the Business Bullshit Dictionary. Uh, I've, I've worked in the corporate world for a long time and I've realized we've got our own jargon that we use. Uh, and it can be especially confusing if you're kind of new to it and you don't know how to read into what these words need. Uh, and that becomes important if you're one of these infrastructure teams and you put an, a, a, a Kubernetes cluster or some other platform in place, you spent all this money, you made this business case, and then no one's using it because you'll encounter this word that you'll hear in the business world called accountability. Now, accountability is, it sounds cool, right? Like that people are going to uh, share in the glory of, of the words that they're using. Uh, they're going to be accountable. But as you can imagine, accountability means you're doing a bad job, right? Like, you never hear this word accountability in an organization that's successful, that's making money hand over fist, things are going well. They're not like, whoa, we cleared $5 billion in profit last year. How about that accountability? It's really working out around here. This word only comes up when something's going wrong and you're like a few quarters away from like the downside of accountability, which is, uh, I don't go over this one, which is called uh, optimizing, uh, which is something you definitely don't want to hear or, or encounter. So uh, this is me. Uh, you can see I like to wear the same shirt uh, a lot. Uh, it's, it's lasted a long time. Um, I've had, I've had the, the luck to work in the, the, the tech world since maybe 95. I have an English and philosophy degree, so I can't do math in public. But that feels like a long time. 
I was a programmer a long time ago, and I fell into uh, being an analyst at Redmonk, you know, the developers of the new Kingmakers people. Uh, and I did M&A and strategy at Dell and a bunch of other stuff. I worked at BMC Software. This crowd probably knows them, at least some of the older people, which is great. Usually I say that and people are like, I, I don't know, is that building materials or something uh, of a sort? Uh, but now I, I, then I worked at Pivotal, which became VMware, which is now Broadcom. Uh, and I've been lucky to basically just study how large organizations do this kind of thing. I can't program anymore. I can make slides. I can talk, which is hopefully evident. Uh, and so I go out and I talk with management and executives, uh, things like that, folks like yourself. And I try to learn what works and doesn't work to improve the way that they're doing their software, right? The software that we all use from our banking software to, uh, I don't know, buying stuff interacting with governments, all of that kind of stuff. I'm really interested as a former programmer in how software makes our lives better, like uh, whether it's interacting with uh, companies or, or uh, filling up our entertainment space, uh, which is an odd phrase. Anyways, I've written some books and I've got a couple podcasts and all of that kind of stuff. And very importantly, I'm a recovering thought leader. Now, this has happened in the past couple of years that I'll get into. I mean, that's basically, we call it developer relations, things like that. But a large part of what we're doing is thought leading, right? We're going out into the world and we're trying to introduce a new concept, a new tool uh, on behalf of our commercial organization. Usually, there's, it's a very minority that's not commercial. And we're trying to make people interested in an idea to uh, make our business viable, right? Infrastructure as code, DevOps, Kubernetes, uh, SRE, uh, what, what a top, platform engineering. Most of these have a commercial interest behind them that were driven by a lot of thought leadership that makes everyone say like, ooh, we gotta hear about that. Uh, uh, which is actually, you know, great. People used to call it evangelism, uh, which has weird overtones uh, nowadays. Uh, but I've been doing this uh, pretty successfully for a while, or, or at least as far as success is rated by uh, I enjoy it. Um, and, you know, it's been great, right? Like, it's really a good, uh, if you're interested in getting in that kind of life, uh, of course, someone like me, this is the thing about thought leaders, they love to talk about themselves, and a podcaster as well. Uh, so I'm happy to talk about it, but it results in all sorts of great things. Like, I've met all sorts of people. I've, like, you know, from way back when, you know, I, I wasn't here at the thing 15 years ago, uh, because I, I, uh, I don't think I had a good expense policy at the time. Uh, but. Uh, and that's when I was living in Austin. But you know, you meet all sorts of people, you hang out with them, you do sorts of, all sorts of things. I was lucky enough at Pivotal that it was actually at a company that IPO'd, which is phenomenal, right? Like that's, uh, it's, it's a fun thing to uh, do there. Uh, and, and I've gotten to be friends with, with all these people over the years. Uh, but you know, in the past, let's say year and a half or so, like things, things got a little weird for the type of thought leadering that I was doing, which is kind of like, I think I'm over it now. I, you know, there was also uh, uh, COVID, and I, I had, uh, I had uh, as I call it, a bonus baby uh, which would, during COVID, which is fun. So that's, you know, there's lots of stuff when I talk to my therapist, uh, lots of stuff adds up and it kind of overflows. It's never mind burnout at work, just burnout at life uh, occurs. But this was sort of like the, uh, so I think I'm over that, but this was kind of like the thing that really pushed it over the edge. Our, our friend Kubernetes here. Now, I didn't really say this, but I come from the Cloud Foundry uh, community, being at Pivotal. Uh, which I'll, I'll mention a little bit. Cloud Foundry is great. It works. Tons of people use it. Uh, and then our friend here came and, and really just sort of like looked at maybe the past five or six years of, of my career. I don't even think it looked at me. That's, that's uh, too much uh, whatever. And it's just like, uh, how about none of that? And, and like, how about we just do some thought leadering and drive all of that out of people's minds? And uh, uh, see you later. Uh, now, uh, you know, that results in essentially like when that happens, I don't know if you've ever had, maybe some, there's some network administrators out there. When you've had something you've invested a lot of time and passion in and it just sort of gets uh, blown away almost by accident uh, by people, it kind of causes a bit of a crisis, especially if you're a thought leader and you have no thoughts anymore. That's sort of right there in the title. If you don't have thoughts, you can't really be a thought leader. Uh, so I've been trying to kind of pull back from that and figure out how to generate some new thoughts. Hence the uh, this is a new project I'm going to start up. Uh, I've been solo role-playing, playing D&D with uh, ChatGPT, and it's going kind of well. And I thought what I should do, since everyone's into that, is I should come up with a standard test playing D&D and do it across all the different AI things. And uh, if you saw JJ talk the other day, you know, he does uh, DevRel for Watson X, so I figure I can get a free account 
uh, and, and compare it on that. Uh, but hopefully I'll be able doing that uh, over the next couple of years. That seems like something uh, fun rather than infrastructure. No, no offense. Um, <coughs> so let's delve back into the business bullshit dictionary. Let's take a step back. Now, when you hear this, uh, I remember my first programming job. Uh, there, was, there was one of those RTFM sort of geniuses uh, who, who was, was uh, oh, I forgot to start my timer, so we'll see how this works out, uh, uh, who, who I would go up to and I would ask, like, how do you do this? And the first thing he would do is he would spin around in his chair and he would say, why do you want to do that? And this is the corporate equivalent of why do you want to do that instead of just answering your question, right? And so you'll be in a meeting. Uh, you're saying like, oh, this new, uh, this new pickle thing came out. It's not the X-windowing thing, uh, but it's like it's, it's from Apple, so it must be great. Have you seen how much money they make? And boy, we love their equipment, uh, most of us at least. Uh, so we should probably just start using this uh, because it's going to be great. I mean, it scales, right? Have you seen their stuff? And then you'll have someone say, let's take a step back and really ask why we want to do this. What's the basis of this? Now, in this instance, it's kind of is an appropriate use of let's take a step back. But often what it means is whatever you're saying, I'm not interested in, right? <laughs> they they want to take a step back and kind of uh, go back to whatever the conversation was. So now that we've taken a step back, uh, let's, let's think about why people are resistant to change. Now, you may not read all of the, uh, the Bain, BCG, McKinsey, KPMG, Gartner, Forrester, all these reports about change management. But you'll encounter this over and over again, that change initiatives at organizations, 70% of them fail, uh, which, which is pretty depressing, right? You might want to hire uh, a Bain, McKinsey, BCG, KPMG, Capgemini, all these sort of people to come help you uh, with that, which is usually who you hear this from. Now, what you actually find out, uh, there's, there's this uh, actual academic over in the UK who did a study, and he was like, where does this 70% come from? And there's a great paper uh, that's not very academic, and if you read it, he's like, you know where it comes from? Nowhere. It just comes from, if you trace it back to the early 90s, uh, this guy, uh, Cotter, and I forget his other person, there's a little passage where they're like, in our experience, 70% of things fail. And that's it. And that launched several decades of this idea that 70% of uh, change initiatives fail. Now, uh, I look at this as almost positive. I'm trying to be more positive in my life, because why not? Uh, and like what this means to me is that actually the success rate is probably high. Now, being a good academic, he makes the point that he's not saying that change happens. He's just saying, we don't know. It could be worse. It could be better. But don't get in your head that change isn't possible. You just have to do the work for it, right? You're not setting yourself up for failure like this uh, would, would have you think. Now, there's another phrase uh, that we use a lot. Uh, my, uh, you know, there's actually a great uh, piece uh, by my, my then coworker uh, Bridget, uh, going over, I think, I think even ACM, the, the hallowed, uh, what is it, the something computing machinery. And that is, you hear this all the time, technology is easy and people are hard. And, you know, I don't know if you've ever worked in technology, uh, probably, but I find that technology is really hard. I mean, and any time that someone tells you that technology is easy, you should convince them that it's hard because you'll get paid more. Anytime what you're working on that someone thinks it's easy, get that out of their head. Never say technology is easy. Say technology is the hardest thing in the world. It's even more hard than properly raising a kid or trying to remember how to find the missing, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the missing uh, angles and links of a triangle. Something about cosine and sine for your kid when you haven't had to use that in your entire life. And, uh, you know, technology is very hard, difficult. Now, I think the other thing is that people are very difficult too. Uh, and by people, what we mean are those people who aren't gonna change. We never, anyone who like actually wants to do what you want, we don't say they're difficult. It's only these people who don't wanna change uh, that end up being difficult. So how do you deal with these people? And that's most of what I'm gonna uh, go over here. Now, after studying it, and I use the word study loosely, let's say lowercase study, uh, these are my anecdotes. They don't result in 70% failure, but that's what they're based on. Uh, after my anecdotal research, uh, I found that most of the problem is management. And what that means is, I don't know that all management looks at their job this way, but you're a bunch of systems people. I see management's job as programmers of architects of the organization they're in. They're the ones who are the system designers and maintainers of that system. And if they haven't set up the system well, then it doesn't work well. 
right? And so that's a lot of where I see the change needing to happen. Not even that infrastructure group. I mean, they set up the clusters. They did their job. Uh, and, and something else wasn't working. Which, speaking of management, uh, being an American, uh, I, I wanted to go over, uh, I'm sure there's a few of my fellow Americans here, uh, maybe watching, but for those of you who are not, and you get the chance, or the curse of working with an American manager, I want to go over something very important from the Business Bullshit Dictionary. Here's what we like to do in America. We have what I like to call, uh, if you'll pardon the phrase, a uh, reverse single-sided shit sandwich approach to feedback, uh, which is to say, We've got some delicious bread, not as good as the bread you get up. I live up in Amsterdam now, and I understand now what good bread tastes like. It's <laughs> phenomenal. Like, it looks hella boring when you go into the grocery store, but that bread is so good. Uh, so, you know, we have our American bread, and then, uh, you know, it's great. You're eating it, the manager. You're in, the, you're in your annual review, and the manager's like, oh, you've been doing a great job. Really appreciated what you're doing. Uh, you know, you did this. That was great. You, uh, you saved us from uh, the mail server going down. I really like how you've been working with people. And then about 30 seconds before the call ends, the American manager will say, uh, you, know, you know, one thing you can improve is uh, I feel like maybe you're a little too abrasive when you talk with other people. See you later. Uh, I'll talk to you in, in about four weeks or so. Uh, and then you go, you, go, you go talk to them. It's more like a quarter. You go with a quarter and you're going in there and you're like, I've gotten all this great feedback. I'm just like configuring the shit out of everything. It's fantastic. And the manager's like, we're going to have to let you go. I, uh, I, I mean, I told you last time that you're a little abrasive and you don't fit into the culture here and you didn't make any changes. And so this is key if you're getting feedback from an American manager is only listen to that last 30 seconds. Everything else they said doesn't matter. It's that one little thing in the shit sandwich that you have to spot that is key to the feedback that they're giving you. So let's look at management and uh, how, how they could change around, right? Now, I think this is key to thinking about why people fear change, again, because they build the systems and the behavior that management has drives a tremendous amount of what's possible uh, in, in people changing, right? Uh, so it's important for them to uh, uh, switch around there. This is actually some stills from, uh, now that I'm thinking this, it actually kind of fits well, from uh, some free video, uh, copyright free or whatever that is from uh, some work sessions at the California Institute of, not Institute, the California Department of Corrections, which is to say jails. And these are building committees, uh, speaking of building uh, systems. So uh, the first thing is, and this is a bit of a uh, uh, turns out sort of thing, is that we do have this notion that the CIOs come and go, right? Like uh, that they're basically there for like, I don't know, the common notion is three years or so. And then every time a new executive comes in, they launch a new initiative, they're gonna fix things, I mean, otherwise, why would they be there? Uh, and there's, there's a coworker of mine who has a joke that like most change initiatives are a one and a half CEO job, right? In that three year term, you're not gonna be able to see the change through, so you're gonna need like another half of a CEO to finish it. Now, it turns out that if you go look at, at least for uh, um, uh, American uh, executives, CIOs have been lasting about 4.7, uh, if I remember, or 3. Point, I wrote it down here, 4.7 years. Uh, so it's a little bit longer. Uh, oddly enough, you would assume this wasn't the case, but the average for CEOs is seven years, which is very encouraging. Uh, but, so it's a little longer than we think, but think about the executives who have come in and if they've actually seen that change through, right? And so there is this notion, whether perception or not, that they're not really committed to this, right? They're just someone who kind of like does some drive-by transformation. Meanwhile, the workers who are staying there longer, uh, like they're sort of like, eh, nice to meet you. I'm going back to my work, nothing will change, right? Like, which is kind of the experience that we have. So this is the first thing is somehow the executives have to prove out that they're not just, uh, you know, gonna be there for a, a tiny amount of time, that they're, they're all in the same boat. Now, the second thing that it comes to management is, is how they perceive uh, the, the workers, like what, how they treat them. And you saw a version of this. I don't know if you followed this uh, back in the fall. There was this huge nerd fight about developer productivity metrics. And what had happened is uh, McKinsey came out and they were like, everyone says you can't measure developer productivity, especially developers. Here's a tip. Don't let people measure you. Just tell them technology is hard. Uh, and they were like, yeah, but like you can measure it which is also true, uh, more or less. And so they were like, here's some four metrics, and they, they kind of were like, oh, that space stuff and the DevOps culture, that's really fantastic, but here's four metrics that matter. And if you look at the four metrics that are highlighted, uh, you can see that they're all about activities that developer do, do uh, does, anyways, the activities they do. 
Now, this gives you a view into how management thinks about developers, probably infrastructure people, people who are doing activities. Now, what they want to do with these metrics, this is where the, 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 the thing comes in, is they're not using those metrics to like, well, the only reason you use these metrics is to get rid of people and punish them, to reward the people who have lots of activity and punish people who don't have the activity. You're trying to optimize, which is to say, uh, spend less, right? So when you introduce these kind of metrics, immediately as management, you're saying like, hey, you should start looking for a job. Uh, like, you know, you're really uh, introducing some accountability uh, and kind of teeing that up. There's another phrase for you uh, for, for a future conversation. So instantly, you're really signaling to people that you're not on their side. Now, in contrast, there's been a lot of great work. There was just a, a, a couple of papers published uh, last year and one uh, in December, January, going over what actually works to measure developers. And I would imagine most IT people, I mean, I'm going to uh, grossly reduce it down which is like, uh, is just ask them if they're happy, right? And, and if they're happy, they like the way that their work is going, chances are they're gonna do good work. I, you know, that, that, I don't know if you've experienced that, but it's generally true. Um, and so there's many studies going over that. I think the work, uh, I always forget the funny names, they come up uh, with things, but this, these DevX metrics, uh, which is in the, uh, you know, the Nicole, uh, uh, Ferguson uh, multiverse uh, entertainment sphere uh, ongoing story like they really do capture how you would measure the effectiveness of developers based on their work environment and and their happiness now the other thing that comes with management that's an issue are of course I'm I'm no uh, I, I'm no thinking fast thinking slow person I tried to read that and it was like reading a phone book almost uh, just sort of like a catalog of like ideas, uh, which I find those kind of books difficult to read. But, you know, I read, I've listened to enough podcasts that I think I know uh, what's going on here. But the incentives between the executives and the workers are very misaligned, usually in the large organizations I work at. So think through the executive scenario. There's these macroeconomic headwinds and competition that's going to bring down this company and decrease the value of it. It's going to be terrible, right? And from their standpoint, if they do nothing, if they don't change, it's all risk. Right? So if they don't change in the face of competition and software eating the world or whatever software is doing nowadays, uh, they're going to have a small amount of compensation. The risk is high that they're going to be rightfully so blamed for the failure. And so they look at the amount of risk that they, the outcome and it's going to be terrible. It's going to be a bomb. But if they do change and they're successful at it, they're going to get a huge amount of compensation because they typically own a lot of equity in the company. So the share price is going to go up. They're also going to get great bonuses. They're going to set their career up well. The risk may be super high for them, but the payoff is massive. And so from an executive standpoint, you're like, well, that's my job, right? To uh, do these things and take risks and do the high thing. Now, if you look at the workers side, workers typically, unless you're in the tech industry, workers typically don't have a lot of equity in the company. Uh, they don't really share in the success of the company. And so if the company uh, like, you know, becomes more successful and its share price goes up, they don't get anything. Right? Like th there's very little that they get to share in that success. Now, from their standpoint, the risk of just keeping what, doing what they were doing yesterday, like it's really not going to trickle down to them very much. Like it'll be fine. And also, if they try to do something new, they have to learn some new way of doing stuff. They might fail at it. So it's a high risk to change, just like it was a high risk for the executive. And so you look at that, and there's really very little incentive for individuals to change versus the, the executives there. Now, of course, what would be nice uh, in most large organizations is if you could align those incentives uh, in these areas, which is what we do in the tech industry usually, and it kind of works out. Uh, but in most of those organizations that have ads in uh, jet bridges and stuff, they don't re they're not really set up uh, this way. So finally, uh, the other thing that I think uh, management comes up against, uh, sorry, I don't want to give you too much of a preview, is the managers usually aren't the people doing the work. And what we learned from Lean is that that means they don't really know what they're talking about when it comes to the work. And yet they are the ones who are kind of dictating the changes. They're buying those books that tell you how to operate a new way. Uh, and I don't know, I mean, that's just kind of obvious. But there's a good anecdote from DevOps Days Dallas a while ago where uh, I think he was one of the chief uh, Lean people at Toyota. And he was doing a, a consulting engagement with a corn distribution company back in the States. Um, and he immediately uh, put the CEO uh, on the line of all the corn sorting to do the work, to try to learn what, how the work is actually done and start to optimize it. 
And needless to say, it was, uh, as they say, an eye-opener for the CEO to be on the line doing the work. And I think that day, uh, that CEO made several changes to one, make the workers' lives better, but also optimize how it was working, right? So imagine you have this uh, CEO, CIO coming in, and then immediately you're like, well, why don't you use Pickle to configure the server? I'll be back tomorrow, right? And they might have a, uh, a little bit more idea of like, uh, if they should do it, how things work. So that's the other thing that like, management often fails at, is really getting on the line and figuring out how things are actually working and then telling people how, how they should do something. So you kind of add all that up and you can see that there's a huge conflict that happens right away when you want people to change. Uh, and so you might be working on that for a year or so, maybe you haven't changed, and then you know at the time of the year, maybe you will be lucky enough, uh, you, know, you won't be stricken to be the subject of this, but you'll be asked to do a 360 review. Now, this is a very important thing from the business bullshit dictionary. Now, a 360 review sounds pretty cool and humane, and it's that we want to have you review one of your peers. They, maybe you don't even use the word review, and we want to have a holistic accounting. We want to get their peers to give a review, their bosses, coworkers, and really just give them a sense of how they're doing and ways they can improve. And you're like, oh, engineers, they love improving. They love getting feedback about things that are going wrong and just so they can target the right thing. Now that is a terrible lie. There's only one thing you ever say in a 360 review. These people are awesome. And you list all the great things that they've done. If you ever are asked to do a 360 review and you want to give feedback about how someone can improve, going back to the American manager thing, that's the only thing that's ever going to haunt them for the rest of their career. So whenever you're asked to participate in a 360 review and they really insist that you talk about ways they can improve, just write in, nope. And I mean, you don't even have to write that in. Just talk about good things. Now, I know this uh, because I was subject to a 360 review from one of my good friends. Uh, and he, I talked to him many years later and he was like, I don't know, I had to make something up. So I said, maybe uh, you could focus on details more. And for years after that, that, I was the guy who doesn't focus on details. No one was like, oh, I really liked your programming, this design for PDF printing in like 2003, fantastic. No, they were like, you know, you should focus on details more. So whenever you have a 360 review, only good things. Don't, don't say anything else. So now let's come to uh, part two, platforms. Uh, now, I don't know if you're aware of this. I don't even know why they're having a 15th uh, anniversary thing. Humanitech puts on platform con, it's online, much lower expenses. That's where you should probably go. Not a DevOps day, because it's dead. Uh, so let's look at what platforms are, because I, I think that's, uh, that's, that's, what's, that's what's going on there. Uh, and, you know, I, 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 I want to say, you know, uh, that, that, that was a joke about uh, not going to DevOps days. Uh, there's a whole other talk to be had about uh, what's up with platform engineering. I'm thinking I need to do a study tracing back uh, basically like the, the technical marketing meeting that they had somewhere in Berlin where they're like, let's do this thought leadering and do the shit out of it. Because uh, it was very successful to, to introduce that idea. Now, a platform, I'm just going to be brief here because I've, I've talked about this a lot. And I'm sure you've seen everything that I've done. If not, there'll be a URL at the end and you have your weekend assignment. Um, so, uh, you know, you've got a platform here. There's a great CNCF definition of it, uh, which you can, you can look up. It's really just all the stuff that developers use to uh, run their applications, built on top of the infrastructure. We used to call it middleware. We kind of know what, uh, what platforms are and uh, they, they've been around forever. Now, there's another great uh, CNCF working group they came out with this platform maturity model. And I think this is really where you can figure out how to get people to adopt to change. Uh, because what it's saying is, here's how you stage out introducing a platform. And it's, it's, I, I had a chance to review it, it's pretty good. And it also sets up expectations about the rate of change and what things look like when you're introducing that platform with people. But the most important thing, uh, in as far as getting people to change with platforms, comes from uh, Thomas here at Mercedes. And that is that you want to think about uh, treating those application developers as customers for what you have, right? If they don't like using your Kubernetes cluster, maybe what you should do is product manage it and go out and ask them what their real problems are. Kind of figure out, like, what do you need me to build? Like, sure, everyone says we should be doing this, but what's really holding you back? And you can do that by sending surveys out. Here's, here's one that's free to use uh, and available. And then you start to product manage, just like application developers would do their own code. You try out new features, you see if it solves their problem, 
so instead of just kind of like delivering a platform to them, you actually work with them month to month on cycles and get feedback about what works uh, and, and doesn't work with them. So let's close out finally with like the, uh, the other thing that's great with platforms is to market the success that they have, right? And then here are, are a bunch of like typical success metrics uh, that, that you see from organizations that have introduced platforms. And this is good not only at the executive to executive level, but also as you're building up case studies for individuals uh, that need to know that it's successful. That if they take on that risk of change, that you actually get not only technical improvements to what you're doing, but also actually business improvements uh, for, for what you're doing, which you can see listed here, right? And that's really like, I think, I think the, uh, uh, you said there's five minutes left? Two, three minutes, all right. That's the problem if you don't press your timer button, you, uh, you lose track of things. So when you introduce these types of metrics, right, what you're trying to show is that it works, right? And that's a key part that I see missing from a lot of technology uh, sort of introduction, why people fear change to it, is you don't think about the marketing aspects of it, right? You don't think about how will I do that thought leadering inside the company? How will I prove that this technology works to the application developers, the staff, and I see organizations doing that staffing right from the first day, thinking about having an internal platform advocate, thinking through all the marketing ideas, their messaging, their positioning, their advantages, but really building up case studies. Because what you want to prove to people who don't change is you don't want to just say, trust me, it's going to work. You want to have their peers who have worked on this, who've already used your platform and been successful at it. You want them to be the ones that are selling it. That's some thought leadering 101 for you, right? You have these trusted sources uh, that will do a, a word of mouth uh, check for you. And that gets us to like, I think ultimately, like if you wanna uh, think about what developers need to change and other people, there's this great, uh, there's this great quote from one of the, uh, the, the executives who was doing change at DBS, a big Singapore uh, bank, right? And you can see pulling it all together from the top down, right? Like you wanna have this idea of the thing that you're switching, you focus on the technology, really talk about how you're simplifying things and accelerating them. Now, of course, this is not what she actually said. That is very far from the truth. I just wrote that in. It's not very good. What the actual vision that they were following was, like how you rate if you're, the new technology you're introducing is good, is you follow the actual uh, thing that she was saying. Now, if you look at this, I don't know if anyone here, you log into your bank and you're like, now it's time for some quality hang time with my bank. Right? Look at your software. There are some people who like to balance their checkbooks, so I imagine some people, well, if you remember what that is, uh, who, who do that. But instead, all the way down to the infrastructure layer, you want to have this mentality of like, is what I'm doing just making the, the customer's life better? And if it's not, then uh, maybe you shouldn't be doing it and you should figure out uh, improving. So with that, uh, if you're interested in, uh, in, in those slides and more things, uh, I'll, I'll be around for a little bit, and uh, I'm always interested in getting feedback and learning uh, from other people so I can say things uh, in slides. And uh, there's also, if you really like the, the business bullshit stuff, there's many more of them uh, which you can go look up as well. They're only about 30 or 60 seconds each, so, uh, you know, good interlude for when you're reading all of my other content. Uh, so with that, thanks for having me. Uh, I, I, uh, I appreciate you uh, listening in. Enjoy the rest of the show. Thank you very much.